we are staying with the topic of identity and we're very happy to have Glenn here and Christine. Christine is actually a participant from last year and is about to start her first job as an assistant professor. So very exciting. And as you can see to all our participants this year, maybe next year you come back as a faculty member, as a presenter. So yeah, thank you so much to, to Glenn and Christine for joining us today. We are very appreciative of this and yeah, just you have sharing rights, so please go ahead. The stage is yours. Great. Thank you so much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever is appropriate for where you are in the world. And um, I'm so glad to be here again this year. Um, thank you for putting it together again. And thank you to all the participants who are here and who care about these issues and care about doing research on these issues. So um, we're very happy to be here. Um, let me switch my screen over real quick. There we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, so my name is Glenn Kreiner. I am a professor and department chair of the Department of Management at the University of Utah. And um, Christine and I will be presenting today. Um, I'll go over a little bit of our agenda in just a second, but I just want to give a, a little bit of background about me and then Christine will introduce herself later, the second portion of what we're doing today. Um, so I have been doing research in a few different areas um, that affect the presentation that we're going to do today. So for many years, I've been doing research in identity and also in stigma in different ways. I've published work on dirty work jobs and stigmatized occupations and stigmatized workers. And I've also looked from an identity lens at different levels. So I've looked at individual, occupational, and organizational level of identity. And a few years ago, I started doing research in the disability space. So I have a 22-year-old daughter who was born with Down syndrome. So from a personal side, we've been in the world of disability and special education for couple of decades now, and I decided to start doing research in this area um, a few years ago, sort of inspired by experiences with my daughter in the school system. And as I started thinking about what her transition would be into the workplace, and so started looking at transition, the transition process for students with disabilities into the workplace and what was or was not being done for them. Um, so that led us to do Few different projects such as on uh, workers on the autism spectrum and on job coaches that help workers with disabilities um, sort of bridge the gap between what they're able to do and what a job requires of them so um, it's been a really fascinating and personally rewarding um, set of research projects these past few years so happy to be here today to talk about some big picture stuff about identity stigma and disability and how we can think about those three things swirling together. So in terms of the way that we're going to spend our time together today, I'm going to give a few minutes of an overview of identity, a few minutes of an overview of stigma, and then have some thoughts as we go about applications to disability research. And then I'm going to turn the mic over to Christine, and she's going to be talking with us about really cool work that she's been doing on her dissertation. And then we'll do our Q&A at the end. And our hope really is to inspire you as you do research in the world of disability that maybe identity and or stigma will be lenses that are useful for you for the research that you're already passionate about. So maybe these lenses are helpful to explain phenomena that you're interested in, or maybe these literatures can connect to the literature that you care about. I think one of the most powerful things about the identity literature, for example, is that it can connect so well to other literatures, right? Identity and motivation, identity and decision making. Right? So hopefully, whatever your particular passions are within the disability research space, either identity or stigma lenses um, will be helpful for you to think about as well. So that's sort of our agenda. And so let's jump into it. So in terms of identity 101, we're calling these first couple of slides. If we think about what identity is, there's a lot of different uses of the term, both 
in sort of regular culture, so to speak, but also within academia. So a lot of different types of researchers look at identity. So management is just one part, but you have psychologists, social psychologists, people in education, a bunch, whole bunch of different types. So it can get really confusing really fast. So that's actually one of the tips is if you're interested in identity research, Try to understand the lay of the land, that there's a lot out there, a lot of different perspectives, but then look to see which of those perspectives would be most helpful for the lens that you're bringing to your research. Okay, so you have a lot to choose from in the identity buffet. So these next few slides really are just superficial in the sense that it's just uh, scratching the surface on what's out there in terms of identity. One of the things that I think is important, sort of no matter the approach in the literature that you take around identity is that identity links past, present, and future. It's not about a fleeting state of mind. Rather, it's about something stable about that individual, group, organization, or other entity linking past, present, and future. It's also important because identity drives behavior. So sometimes people might think, oh, well, identity is just the self-reflection thing, and what does it matter? identity drives behavior and so to the degree that we care about behavior in the workplace and all of us do or should then identity informs that behavior it's been said this is an analogy by dave wetton who was one of the original writers on the idea of organizational identity he made this fun analogy he said you know identity is like an onion and not just because there's lots of layers and if you're a fan of the movie shrek you know, there's a joke in there that he says, ogres are like onions, we have layers. Right? So Dave Wetton said, it's not just because that there's multiple layers, but the more layers we peel away of an identity, just like an onion, the more likely it is to evoke tears. Okay? So there's a little bit funny and sad at the same time, but I think there's a, a truth in that statement that as we peel away some of the more superficial layers of identity, we get to things that are really core about a person. And that's a blessing and a curse in terms of doing identity research that we can be really helpful and uncover a lot, but it's also a sensitive area in terms of understanding how people see themselves and how they show up at work. So another one of the really useful ways to think about identity that we see in a lot of traditions in identity research is to think about the self or what a person is as comprising three different categories of identity. Those categories of individual identity are personal, relational, and social. So I'm going to take a minute on each of those just to understand. So basically, any facet of a person's identity could fall into one of these three buckets. So on the personal identity side, which I have represented here with, like a, with a picture of a fingerprint, the idea is that this is a composition of the unique characteristics, personality, life story, and key events in a person's life. So the unique things that have happened to the person, it's no one else. And while they might have had shared experiences with others, the way that they make that experience a part of themselves is unique to them. So just as the, just like no two people have the exact same fingerprint unless they're um, twins, no two people have the same constellation of personal identity characteristics. By contrast, the second component of individual identity is relational identity. And this is the part of who you are that is based on the roles that you play and the relationships that you have with particular people. So I have pictures here to kind of evoke this image. So I have the, the stern professor, right? So professor is a role that many of us have currently or will have in the future to the degree that i define myself by that role i would call that a relational identity i also have pictures here of like co-workers in the workplace and a father daughter playing together and these are suggestive of how we can define ourselves based on particular relationships so i mentioned my oldest daughter i also have two other children so I have unique relationships with each of my three children, and I can define myself based on those relationships. I can also define myself by the role of father or parent. And to the degree that those things, those labels are a part of how I see myself, then we would call that a relational identity. 
So then the third category here is social identity. And this is the one that we see written about most in the management literature, because this is about social group membership and how we might identify with social groups. So you can immediately see lots of workplace applications here. Work teams would be, if you identify with your team, that's a social identity. The occupation that you're in would be a social identity. The organization you work for would be a social identity. So when Blake Ashforth and Fred Mill wrote their 1989 AMR about organizational identification, most of the emphasis was on social identity because you can see all of these immediate applications for the workplace. So some of the pictures here represent this philosophy of group identity. So one picture we have of like teammates coming together in the huddle, another picture of family members taking a picture on, with the sunset. So we have like the team identity, family identity. And then to represent my university, I put University of Utah football fans, right? Rallying together, showing their social identity as uh, University of Utah students. So each of these are groups that people can identify with. So then let's think for a second about how each of these three types of individual identity might relate specifically to disabilities, because we can see, so we can start to see now how it's important to disentangle these three different types of individual identity, because we could have an, we could have identification with disability and disability groups with each of these three categorizations of identity. So three examples I have here. So on the personal identity side, you might hear someone say, autism is part of my personality, right? That is a, what we call an identity claim. So the person is claiming autistic as part of their identity. It's part of their personal identity because they're saying it's part of their personality. On the relational side, and here's something that I would say in terms of identification, I would say, I'm the parent of a child with Down syndrome. So I am saying, here's a connection that I have to one, one community and my relationship as the father of a child is important to me and so I identify with it. Or someone might have a very broad social identity by making a statement such as, I belong to the disability community. They might have an identification writ large with disability or they might identify with their particular disability. So you can start to see if you think about how these three different facets of identity relate to what we would hear in studies with disability. And you can start to see if it could be useful to start teasing out these differences between personal, relational, and social. So another thing that's really important in terms of sort of basic terminology with identification and identity is that not everybody who belongs to a group necessarily identifies with that group. So belonging is not the same as identifying. Belonging is a category, whereas identity is about self-referential statements. Okay, So just because someone belongs to a group doesn't mean they identify with it. People are in lots of groups that they just they have to be in that group or someone put them in that group, but they don't necessarily define themselves that way. And in fact, what we've done with a lot of research and identity is look at not only identification, Right? Identification is the degree to which you define yourself with something. So all of those types of identities that I just mentioned, personal, relational, and social, I can identify or not with those. So I have a visual here of an overlap of two circles. And the overlap between those two circles is a way of thinking about identification. I share the values, the insights, and the ideas between me and some other person or entity. By contrast, we can also look at disidentification, which I have shown here with the two circles that are separated and non-overlapping. This is how I could define myself as not something else. Ken Elsbach many years ago did really cool research on disidentification, and an example that she used is in politics, how people will not only identify with their particular party, but they will disidentify with the other party. And sometimes what she showed in her research is that sometimes people's disidentifications were actually stronger motives for behavior than their identifications. That making it clear to people they did not belong to a certain group was a stronger voice than actually claiming a group identity. It's really pretty fascinating.
So now if we take identification and disidentification and put them together, that's what's called ambivalent identification. So ambivalent identification is when part of us identifies with an entity and part of us disidentifies with an identity. So the visual here I have is half of you is overlapping and half of you is disentangled from that entity. So if you think about any kind of group that you've belonged to or organization where you have felt like, boy, on the one hand, I really love this aspect of it. And I love uh, this part of the mission, or I love this part of the values of this organization or group. But on the other hand, oh, I just get so frustrated and these people drive me crazy, or I hate that we're doing this. Ambivalence gets at this torn sort of back and forth. I love this part, but I hate that part. I think ambivalent identification is a really cool area of research. We've published a few papers in this area. And I think that it's a, a, if you're looking for sort of cool topics with an identification, I think it's, um, I think it's really cool. So again, thinking about how we can think about this in a disability space, note how people might identify or disidentify with different facets of ability and disability. So someone might identify with the idea of disability or being disabled, generally speaking, as a broad group of people, as a huge part of the planet that has some kind of disability. Or they might identify or disidentify with the particular disability that they have. So they might strongly identify with that community, that group, the uh, people that they interact with. They also could identify with the group members who share their disability. So notice how that's a little bit different. I can identify with a concept like a disability, but I can also identify with the people who share that disability with me. So there's a broad identification possibility and specific relationship identification possibility. So this is one of the benefits of really looking at not just identification, but also disidentification and ambivalence along with recognizing the personal, relational, and social identifications, because of this language and this specificity allows us to drill in into really interesting and complex relationships that people have with themselves and with other people. Okay, a couple more thoughts on identity, and then we'll switch over to stigma. Another term that you might find helpful if you're doing research in this area is identity orientation. So in identity orientation, really is just the proportion of each type of identity that makes up our self-concept. So if you think about a pie, and that pie is going to be divided by slices that are relational identity or collective identity or personal identity, then we can see people have different proclivities. So here in this first visual, I have a pie, we're calling it Kathy's self-concept. Half of Kathy identity is relationally based. A small part of it, her identity is collective identity based and the medium size of it is personal identity based. But you could contrast that to someone, let's call him Ricardo. Ricardo's self-concept is half collective identity parts, a little bit relational and a pretty decent amount of personal identity. And then let's compare that to someone called Neity. Neity's self-concept is half personal based, a little bit relational and a substantial amount of collective. So there's been really cool research over the past 10 or so years on this idea of identity orientation that in addition to the very specific things that we might identify with, you know, people, organizations, groups, we can kind of pull back and say, if we put all of those different identifications into these three buckets, relational, collective, and personal, what's the proportion? And that that proportion actually can tell us something about the person beyond the specific small identifications, that there's a way that that person interacts with the world and with people that is different from the person next to them, okay? So again, identity orientation might be a cool thing for you to investigate in your own research. Okay, last slide I have on identity before I start talking about stigma is and I was trying to think of themes and trends in the identity research that you might find useful with your disability research. One of the things that I think is really interesting is the temporality of identity. In other words, 
going back to that core idea of how identity involves past, present, and future, what can we do with that? And what we're actually seeing is there's an increasing interest among identity scholars about these temporal dynamics, right? And I've given you several examples here in the slide. So Arminia Ibarra has talked about provisional selves, which is this idea of sort of testing out an identity that may or may not work for you. Um, Sally Maitlis has a really cool chapter and other work on the loss of professional identity. So she studied professional musicians who, for some reason, like got in a car accident or had a debilitating illness or something like that, could no longer perform the instrument that they had been trained on. And so she studied that traumatic loss of professional identity and how people cope with it. Um, there's also been work on future work self, like how do we think about ourselves in the future as a worker. Um, interesting work a few years ago um, from Otilia Obudaru on foregone professional identity. And recently we've done some work on what we call legacy identification, which is identities that were really strong and salient in the past, such as like when you went to college and you had that really strong identity, and you still carry that with you, but it's not the same type of identification as it was in the past. We call that legacy identification. Another theme in the temporality of identity that you might find interesting is identity transitions or how we move from one role to another, either during the day or over time. And so if we think about applications to disability around these temporal issues, these are several things that Christine and I thought about that might be helpful for you to, in terms of research topics that you might want to do. The experience of becoming disabled, that would be a role transition from a non-disabled identity to a disabled identity. How do people go through that? Uh, temporary versus permanent disabilities. There's a, such a wide range of disabilities and the temporal lens on identity allows us to think about what's well, the difference between temporary versus permanent disabilities in terms of how people identify with it. Um, what if one loses a disability identity because they're no longer disabled? What does that process of role and identity exit, exit look like? We can think in terms of an anticipatory identity. People have a fear of becoming disabled that they articulate sometimes. What does that look like? What is that mental process like? Is it based on experiences that they have had with family members in the disabled community or not? Um, also, there's interesting idea of some experience fluctuating periods of symptoms, right? So disabilities are very different and manifest themselves very differently in terms of episodic versus chronic. Well, how does that affect the temporality of someone's identity as they engage with their disability? And then, of course, there's differences between congenital versus acquired disabilities. So how can we apply a temporal identity lens to these different groups? I think it'd be very cool research. Okay, with my last few minutes, I just want to do a couple slides on stigma. But first, thank you for hopefully reading the um, shameless plug that we had for our own research. Um, but we figured it is as hot off the press <laughs> and it would hopefully relate to a lot of the research that you all are doing. And if not, hopefully it can inspire you. We also have, Christine and I also have a recent book chapter that's specifically about identity and stigma. So if you're interested in that, please shoot us an email and we'll get you a copy of that chapter. Um, so stigma, connecting now what we have talked about with identity to stigma. Um, stigma is when there's an apparent discrepancy between what someone wants to see themselves and how other people see them or a devaluation or an attribute that somehow discredits them. So someone said to be stigmatized or a group or organization is said to be stigmatized when it's associated with some kind of dubious or tainted social category. So this was actually my first area of research as a doctoral student was looking at dirty work jobs or jobs that required workers to engage either with dirty things or with people who were stigmatized and how people dealt with the stigma associated with the work that they had to do. So it's a very complicated process because there's issues of labeling, stereotyping, separation, possible status loss, discrimination, 
So there's a lot of organizational behavior and social psychological processes wrapped up in stigma. It's not a standalone idea. And part of what Christine and I, with our co-author Sven Mikkelen did in the review article, was look at how stigma relates to a lot of other concepts as well. So that's one of the things that's important to realize that stigma connects to a lot of other social evaluations. Stigmatized individuals are subject to downward social comparisons, bullying, harassment, social rejection, all kinds of negative costs. And so it's no wonder why that there has been a most of the focus and the organizational research is on the negative effects of stigma. But these negatives aren't fixed or predestined because stigma is socially constructed. And so what that means is that stigma can change. Stigma, stigma can be reduced or eliminated or at a minimum managed. So we don't have to take this uh, for granted that a stigma has to surround some facet of a person or group. An attribute, in fact, that is stigmatizing in one place might be neutral or positive in another. So just because in one social context, something stigmatizing, it could be neutral or positive somewhere else. So stigma isn't constant. It's not absolute, but it can change meaning across contexts, cultures, times, and places. And in fact, there's a growing research interest in the potential opportunities of stigma of how it can be a call to action for change and reform. It can be used as a form of entrepreneurial emancipation, and it can encourage resilience and post-traumatic growth. So really interesting research these past few years on the positives of stigma or how to leverage the energy around the stigma into something positive. There's also this newer lens around stigma being a dual-edged sword, recognizing both the pros and cons of the stigma. So many researchers the past few years have used this term double-edged sword around stigma. And we suggest that future research can really focus on this blend of positive and negative elements. I think it's a more holistic and a more hopeful lens through which to study stigma rather than just assuming all of the negatives. It's a really interesting way to think about negatives and positives swirling together. So then another part that's really important with stigma research is figuring out about stigma and the non-stigmatized, because we don't want to just think about half of the equation, right? The person who has the stigma. We also want to understand those engaging in the stigmatizing and destigmatizing processes. So the non-stigmatized half of the equation, we can call them allies, go-betweens, the whys. These are all terms that have been used in the literature for people who work on behalf of people with a stigma. These could be people in formal roles, such as mental health workers, job coaches, human resource representatives, or informal roles like friends or coworkers. And they can be pivotal in helping stigmatize people cope with the stigma or trying to destigmatize either locally or broadly. So we can think about destigmatizing on a national or global or societal level, or more locally, like in a work team, work department, or work organization. So some of the things that we've found in our own research around destigmatization is that people can destigmatize by showing capabilities. They can destigmatize by cultivating self-advocacy, helping people with a stigma advocate for themselves. But we can also think of systemic ways to destigmatize, such as pushing for inclusion and changing societal structures. Now, one of the things that I have um, been involved with the past few months that's really cool is trying to understand stigma and mental health. There's a high co-occurrence of disability and mental health issues. So for everyone here in this conference, that's something to have on your radar is the co-occurrence between these two things. And a few months ago here at the University of Utah, the Huntsman Mental Health Institute launched what's called a Grand Challenge Campaign. So Grand Challenge Campaign is like a big idea of how to change something in society. And they're investing a lot of money over the next decade plus on how to end the stigma surrounding mental health. So I'm including in the slides, which we'll share with all of you, you'll have access to a link if you wanna learn more about this grand challenge. And it's a decade plus initiative, national scope here in the United States is their focus. But the idea is that over the next several years, they can start to see what is working and what is not, 
to have more global implications. So it's a pretty cool initiative. If you're interested in learning more beyond what you can see on the website, feel free to email me about that. All right, my last slide before I turn it over to Christine is that we wanted to leave you with some future research suggestions for stigma and identity from a disability lens. So one thing we think could be cool is looking at the consequences of disability stigma that cuts across life domains like the work family or work home literature testing the effectiveness of different stigma reduction tactics, uncovering cues, behaviors, and verbal accounts used by stigma bearers to signal their stigma in order to see how others subsequently perceive the stigma. So what seems to work and not work? Multi-level theorizing, for example, how do policies around a disability in a workplace interact with managerial attitudes and how do those interact with worker behavior. So rather than just looking at one level or another, if we can involve multiple levels in our theorizing, it'll be more effective. And then linking disability stigma to other morality-based literatures like moral identity, moral foundations theory, and ethical leadership. Those are three really cool literatures that uh, the passive leaders are getting more and more traction in business journals. And I think it would be really cool to link disability in terms of identity and stigma to those. And then we can think about bubble up versus trickle down destigmatization processes. I think this would be really interesting research. So bubble up is more about individuals doing things that then aggregate to the group or organization, whereas trickle down is more about policies that managers and leaders implement that then trickle down into the system. So these are some ideas that we thought about um, if we had endless time and could do everything that we wanted, uh, but we don't, but you all perhaps have some interest in, in incorporating stigma and identity into your research. So those are, those are some tips for um, ideas to get you started. So with that, I will turn the mic over to Christine and then we will do sort of Q and A all together at the end. Great. Thanks so much, Glenn. That was, I, it's always fun to hear you share.